Bailey, Micah's son, his, his movie career has taken off since he's been shooting these the last few weeks. Joy Veron sat in her hospital room alone, alone with her pain, her tears, and the memory of the SUV rolling over her body. Vacation turned to tragedy when her car slipped out of gear, headed toward a Colorado mountain ravine, car carrying her three children. Joy was looking at a cabin with her parents who were considering buying it when they noticed the car moving. She and her dad raced toward the car. She got there first. Fearful that she couldn't get to the driver's uh, door in time, she placed herself right in front of the car. She was able to slow down the car enough that her dad could get in on the passenger side and stop the car. That was October 1999. Her kids still remember her face as the car ran over her. She broke her back. She had severe internal injuries. She was airlifted to a hospital in Farmington, New Mexico. Her condition was so fragile in ICU that they didn't operate for 12 days. She emerged from the operation with a terrible fever. The doctors tried everything, but they couldn't get it under control. The fever raged. Joy was fearful, fearful of dying, fearful of being a paralytic. She pleaded with her mom for help. Her mom stepped out to call friends to pray. She said, I'll be right back. Joy was alone in her hospital room. But not for long, a man came in. She'd never seen him before. Per her request, she only wanted female nurses. So it wasn't a nurse. Didn't appear to be a doctor. He was striking. He was tall. He had silver white hair. Went down his back in a ponytail. And he had clear blue eyes. He walked over to her bedside and picked up her chart and was leafing through it. But he didn't appear to be reading it. He said, Joy, you're going to be all right. You're going to get through this. And then just as quickly as he'd come in, he left. Her mom came back in and she told him all about this man. She said, I'm going to be okay. Mom rushed out to try to find this guy, couldn't find him. She talked to the nurses. They didn't know anybody matching that description. Who was this guy? Well, Joy knew who she believed he was. He was heaven sent to help her through. And she has been okay. She's had a painful life, a difficult life, a life in a wheelchair. But she's remembered his words to help her through many, many times. Joy, you're going to be okay. You will make it through this. Who was this visitor? An emissary sent by God? Joshua faced a similar situation. Like Joy's nightmare of being run over by an SUV, Joshua faced the walls of Jericho. Here's what you need to know about Jericho. Two huge walls went around this city of stone rock houses. The outer wall was 7 feet thick and 16 feet tall. The inner wall was 12 feet wide and 8 feet taller. 
There was a thick forest of palm trees, three feet wide, or three miles wide and eight miles long, that protected the east side of the city. A mountain uh, protected the west side. The city was filled with fierce and barbaric fighters. They withstood all sieges and repelled all invaders. Joshua and his army was, was camped outside of Jericho. Every morning when the sun inched up over the eastern ridge, the Israelites saw the light unveil the proud and mighty Jericho. After crossing the Jordan, the Israelites were trapped inside Canaan with their enemies, with the river now rushing again at flood stage. They had no fortress to which they could retire. The simple alternatives were victory or death. Joshua and his soldiers never faced such a challenge. Perhaps you're cha facing a challenge like you've never faced before. It looms on the horizon like an angry Jericho, imposing, strong. It consumes your thoughts and saps your strength. It wakes you up and keeps you awake. Maybe it's a kid at school who taunts you, or a teacher who hates you, a boss who's demanding, or a coworker that doesn't pull their weight, a parent who's unfair. A sibling who is mean. An ex who makes your life miserable through a terrible custody battle. A child who's rebellious. A diagnosis that's left you devastated. A business that is struggling. A loved one who's you've just lost. An employee who's not working out. A dream that looks out of reach. A marriage that appears to be on the rocks. A habit you cannot kick. It stands between you and the promised land. Like Joshua, you can see it. Like Joshua, you must face it. And like Joshua, you don't have to face your Jericho alone. If you want to read along with me on our text today in Joshua 5, in the, in the Bibles we have under the seats, it's going to be on page 216, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And when it comes from, uh, to heaven to earth communications, God seems to have only one rule. There is no rule. With Abraham, three strangers came for dinner. Did he serve them angel food cake for dessert? In the case of Moses, God spoke through a burning bush. A talking donkey got Balaam's attention. A blazing angel guarded the empty tomb. Yet no visit is more mysterious than this one. Who was he? Let's eliminate some options. He wasn't an apparition. He had muscles. He held a sword. He spoke with a voice and vocal cord. That's not an apparition. Nor was he an angel. Angels do not accept worship. Anytime someone bows down to an angel in the scripture, the angel tells him, get up, do not worship me, worship God. This guest was not a human being. It leaves only one option. God incarnate. This was Jesus Christ. What Jesus did for us at Bethlehem, he did for Joshua at Jericho. Uh, dismiss the notion of an angel with chiffon wings and rosy cheeks. This was the commander of the Lord's army, Jesus Christ himself. 
The message to Joshua is unmistakable. Jericho may have walls, but you have God. Jericho may be strong, but Jesus is stronger. Isn't that the message Joshua needed? A reminder of God's mighty presence? Isn't that all any of us need? We need to know God is with us. Every now and then, Jory will wake up in the middle of the night and say, Ron, there's somebody on our deck. Something's happening on the driveway. There's somebody walking around in the house. So I do what any strong man does. I pull the covers over my head and act like I don't hear. <laughs> then I hear a little later, Ron. So then I get up and I grab a bat or some implement of war and I walk around the house. I go outside if necessary. Then I come back and crawl in bed and I said, everything's fine. Within a minute, she's back to sleep. All she wanted to know is that I have everything under control. You need to know that God is with you and he has everything under control. You will never face Jericho alone. Are you facing a Jericho level challenge? Do you face walls that are too high to breach, too thick to crack? Are you nose to nose with a diagnosis, a defeat, or difficulty that keeps you from entering into the promised land? Then do what Joshua did. He looked up and saw Jesus. Now, I don't think he knew it was Jesus. But he fell face down in the ground in worship before him. As long as our eyes are on our Jericho, we won't see Jesus. We have to look up. In January of 1956, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got a threatening phone call. It wasn't the first foreboding message he'd received. But on that night, with his children and his wife sleeping, the weight of the civil rights movement felt too heavy for him to bear. At midnight, he sat over his kitchen table and he said, God, the people expect me to lead. But if I'm afraid, then they're going to falter too. God, I can't do this anymore. And he began to map out an exit strategy. He said, I can't, God, I can't do this alone. It's just too much for me to bear. And King writes that he felt God's presence more than any other time in his life. Felt like God was saying to him, pursue the truth and righteousness and I will be with you every step of the way. He lifted up his eyes and looked at God. We have to remember, read this with me. Jericho may have walls, but we have God. Jericho may be strong, but Jesus is stronger. For a book about conquests, Joshua sure skimps on military details. What weapons did Joshua's army use? How many officers did he have in the army? How many soldiers were in each battalion? Did he have an elite force? The answer to all these questions is we don't know. We, know. we don't know because the emphasis is not on a physical battle but a spiritual one. The real conflict wasn't with the Canaanites but with Satan and his demons. Canaan was the choicest real estate on earth. It connected Africa with Europe, the east with the Mediterranean Sea. But the book of Joshua isn't about claiming prime real estate for a dislocated people. It's about preserving a stage for God's redemption. This is the country into which his son, Jesus Christ, will be born. These are the people that would prepare his way. Satan's strategy was clear. 
contaminate the promised land. Canaan was the most wicked country on the earth. They had Satan worship and witchcraft and child sacrifice and prostitution in the religion. Satan's strategy was contaminate the promised land and preempt the promised child. Destroy God's people and destroy God's work. Joshua's battle then was a spiritual one. So was ours. The Apostle Paul writes, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We always think it is. But against rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The idea of an actual devil strikes many people as odd and outdated. But the writers of the Bible will not back down on this point. Joshua's battle was spiritual. Joshua's soldiers never swung a hammer. His men never dislodged a brick. They never rammed a door, or pried loose a stone. The shaking, quaking, and tumbling of the thick walls, God did that for them. God will do that for you. Your Jericho is your anger. Your bitterness, lack of forgiveness, prejudice, anxiety, fear, lust, addiction, or guilt about your past. Your Jericho is anything that stands between you and the promised land. The Lord tells Joshua the battle plan. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. They were afraid. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Joshua says, Yeah, got it. He's thinking, Now the Lord wants us to get our swords and spears ready. As Joshua looks at Jericho's foreboding walls, he's wondering how many ropes and ladders he needs to scale the wall and battering rams to push down the gates. We read on. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Joshua goes, trumpets? Why, Lord? On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. Joshua is going, huh? When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole, whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Joshua was thinking, wait a minute, Lord, you forgot something. You didn't mention the battering lambs, rams, the ladders, the spears and arrows. God's plan is designed so that people will recognize that victory comes from him. But Joshua had commanded the people, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word and the day, until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. He tells the people to be quiet, no chit-chat. No opinion giving or second guessing, no whining, no sarcasm. He knows if the people are allowed to talk, they'll begin to say things like, this is so dumb. I mean, if they come out of Jericho, we're sitting ducks, we're dead men. So he tells them to be quiet. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times. In the same manner, except that on the day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. At the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so every man charged straight in, and they took the city. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house, bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young man who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, brothers, 
and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. What kind of warfare is this? This is spiritual warfare. Every battle ultimately is a spiritual battle. Every conflict is a conflict with Satan and his forces. The Apostle Paul urges us to stand against the wiles of the devil. He uses the Greek word methodia, where we get our English word methods. Satan has methods and strategies. The Apostle Paul also writes, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Just like Joshua's battle. Very different from the world's sort of battle. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds are ways of thinking that keep us from God, from our promised land inheritance. They're attitudes of mind that stand between us and promised land living. Does a stronghold have a stronghold on you? Do you see nothing but Jericho? Do you feel nothing but despair? Do you think thoughts of defeat? Do you speak the language of impossibility? I wrote down several here. God could never forgive me, the stronghold of guilt. Bad things always happen to me, the stronghold of victimhood. I'll never recover, the stronghold of defeat. I must be good or God will reject me, the stronghold of performance. I could never forgive that person, the stronghold of bitterness. I don't deserve to be loved, the stronghold of rejection. I'm only as good as I look, the stronghold of appearance. I cannot control my passions, the stronghold of lust. I could go on. We can only overcome our strongholds with spiritual power. We cannot defeat them on our own. We must depend on Christ's power. We must depend on the inheritance power of the Holy Spirit living within us. That power is the same power which God used when he raised Christ from the dead. That lives in you. The key to putting to God's power to work in our lives is to learn to depend on Christ minute by minute. The Apostle Paul writes, Indeed in our hearts we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. This is one of the great lessons of putting God's power to work in your life. We trust in God, not in ourselves. Paul makes the same point. Not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. We admit our weakness without Christ and depend on Him. With His strength, we can tear down strongholds. We can tear down the walls of Jericho that are too great for us. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. God did not say, Joshua, take the city. He said, receive the city I have given you. The same thing could be said for you in the challenge you face. God says, he doesn't say, Sam, break your bad habit. He says, Sam, I have broken the bad habits of your life. Receive the blessing of my victory. Remember, God has embedded within you the very essence of Christ. That is your inheritance. Was Jesus victorious? Did he overcome sin and death? Yes. Will you be victorious? Yes. The question is not will you overcome, but when will you overcome? Things are different in the promised land. Hang-ups and addictions do not have the last word. Resist self-labeling. I'm just a worrier. 
My dad was a drinker, and I guess I just have to carry on the tradition. My dad was caustic, so I have to be the same way. Stop that. These are words of self-defeat. These words create an alliance with the devil. They grant him access to your spirit. It's not God's will that you live a defeated, marginalized, unhappy, and weary life. Turn a deaf ear to the old voices and make new choices. Live out your inheritance, not your circumstances. Amen. How do you do this? By keeping your focus on God. Joshua and the Israelites put the Ark of the Covenant at the front with the priests ahead of the army. So they kept their eyes, and that's the symbol of God. So they're keeping their eyes on God as they march around the city. Remember, Jericho may have walls, but you have God. Jericho may be strong, but Jesus is stronger. Listen to this true story of a man who found spiritual power in the face of cancer. I'm just going to read it to you. If anyone had told me at the beginning of 1996 that I would accept Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, I would have bet all the money I ever made against it. It isn't that I disliked Christ or was against him in any way, it's just that I'm Jewish. My mother is Jewish, my father is Jewish, all my uncles, aunts, everyone in my ancestry is Jewish. So why would I come to Christ? To me, Christ was someone to whom condemned prisoners and lost souls cling in the most ter terrible time of need. But I always lived a good life and conducted myself in a highly moral and ethical manner, not only in my business, but as a father and with all my fellow human beings. And I had done it all by myself, with no help from God. But on December 6, 1996, I was diagnosed with adenocarcinoma, a cancer which has spread to my liver, lungs, pancreas, and bones. My doctors gave me six months to live, told me surgery was not an option, and that chemotherapy not, might not be effective. Worse yet, I was told I would probably be confined to a wheelchair because of the massive tumors in my lower spine and right hip. When we're faced with frightening words like these, the most horrible things enter our minds. First comes panic, then a deep-rooted fear. Whether we choose to fight the cancer or accept imminent death, we face an incredible journey, both emotionally and physically. It also takes a devastating toll on our family. They feel helpless. At least the one with cancer can do something to fight it, but loved ones have no idea what to do. Anyone who's ever faced cancer will tell you courage is the one thing you need most of all. And yet at the time, it seems totally out of reach, unattainable. You feel lost with no way out. That's exactly how I felt December 6, 1996. I had no idea that within two weeks, my sister Roseanne would help me find a path of rescue. Roseanne had fought her own difficult battles. In her first week of life, she caught a staph infection and lost a lung. At age two, she was burned when her crib caught fire. At age 13, she was raped and doctors told her she would never have children. A few years later, she began a long bout with alcoholism, then suffered through a terrible marriage filled with verbal and emotional abuse. In 1991, she learned she had contracted hepatitis C. Finally, she was diagnosed with a rare form of skin cancer. <laughs> what a life. But seven years ago, she found her way to Christ and gained all the strength, peace, and will to survive that any human being could need. Today, she is married and has given birth, contrary to the doctors, to two precious boys. When Roseanne heard about my cancer, she advised me the time had come for me to look to the New Testament for inner peace and solace. She passionately tried to convince me Christ was the only way to escape my predicament. That was hard for me to stomach. In my entire life, I had never asked anything from God. Anyway, it seemed futile for me to try and connect with Jesus. I could envision God saying to me, oh, so now you want to come to me. You're faced with cancer and could possibly die soon, so you want me to help you. You didn't need me before, but now all of a sudden you want to do business. I don't think so. The answer's no. <laughs> As a young boy, I occasionally went to church with friends for weddings, confirmations, and the like. I remember seeing a large cross with a statuette of Jesus hanging on it. This really scared me because as a Jew, I figured I was partly responsible for putting him there. So how could I turn to him as an adult? 
I was scared and without a trace of hope. In the two weeks following my diagnosis, I checked out a ton of books to understand the cancer. What I discovered didn't encourage me. For the first time in my life, I contemplated suicide. I began to think of the pain my children would have to endure, as well as my own physical agony. Would I be reduced to something like a survivor of a Nazi concentration camp? Would I lie helpless in life support, with tubes and IV lines sprouting out of me like a medical pincushion? I couldn't bear the thought, yet after a period of calm, I realized I could never take my own life. Instead, I did what my sister suggested. I opened the New Testament and began to explore the scriptures. Many passages spoke powerfully to me, but what stood out most were the promises God seemed to be making. The more I read, the more I saw what God wanted to do for me. He was telling me I'd be okay no matter what, and all God wanted from me was my faith and a general relationship with him. I called my sister and told her I was now ready to accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. My sister immediately booked herself on the next flight from Orange County to Monterey, California. She wasn't taking any chances. She had a hot prospect and had to close the deal before he changed his mind. So on December 16, 1996, the two of us found ourselves down on our knees in my living room and I asked Christ into my heart. From that moment, I no longer feared, feared the cross. Today, I cling to it like cream cheese to a kosher bagel. <laughs> the greatest thing I learned as a baby Christian is that God doesn't, doesn't think like we do. God is so filled with unconditional love for us that he'll take us any way he can get us, anytime, any place, right up to the moment of our death. I wish I could report to you that he did fine, he was healed, and life was perfect, but not so. He died May 27th, 1998. But he died without a fear of death, knowing that he would go to be with Christ in heaven. What was true for him can be true for you. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you can do so today. Your battle doesn't need to be with cancer. It can be in a, a relationship that's gone awry. Or a financial concern. Whatever. Whatever it is, remember that Jericho may have walls, but you have God. Jericho may be strong, but Jesus is is stronger. Lord Jesus, thank you for this passage in the Old Testament where we meet you appearing to Joshua to assure him that he's going to be okay, that you're with him. And you give us the same promise today. If we've committed our lives to you, you come and live within us with the same power that God used when he raised you from the dead. But Lord, we fail to live by that power so often. We live with our fears and, our, and we just try to fight everything alone. Help us to change and focus on you and the power we have available to us if we lean on you and turn to you. You want to do that right now? I want to give you a moment to pray. Tell God about your Jericho or, or the things in your life that you just don't know how to get over through And tell him you want to keep your focus on him. If you've never committed your life to Christ, this would be a great time to do it. Invite him into your life as your Lord. You pray right now. Lord Jesus, thank you that you hear our prayers and that if we commit our lives to you, you come and live within us through your Holy Spirit and we have amazing power available to us to live a new inheritance life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.